guys, Brett Apple here from DailyFanMMA.com, back with another UFC Quick Picks on the Mayo Media Network. We have UFC Vegas 54 this weekend, Rakic versus Blahovich in the main event. Uh, only 11 fights on the slate, which provides an interesting dynamic coming off 15, 14 fights in our last event. Um, as usual, I'm going to give you my favorite DraftKings cash play, tournament play, salary play, and my fade of the week. And before I do, make sure you subscribe to the channel, like the video, comment below. Uh, give me your favorite play below 8.7. Anyone below 8.7 is in play. There's a lot of interesting options in the mid-range. Very curious to hear who you guys like. Without further ado, I'm going to give my cash game play, which is Nick Maximoff at 9.3k all right moving back up to the top of the pricing board this week for cash games i like nick maximov my boy at 9.3k he is 2-0 in the ufc he has put up two big scores we've cashed on him both times he's been on the optimal lineup both times 96 points 124 points if you followed my lead on maximov to this point you've probably made a bunch of money and now he's the biggest favorite on this slate at minus 340 against Andre Petrosky. And uh, the main event is pretty tricky this week with Rakic and Blahovich, not necessarily supposed to be the highest paced fight. So I am looking to target more, you know, safer options in theory. And as the biggest favorite on the card, Maximov is in theory relatively safe. He also has a wrestling based style which scores very, very well on DraftKings, and he is very willing to attempt takedowns in volume. In his first two UFC fights, he's attempted 15 and 16 takedowns, coming off a division record 11 takedowns against Punahele Soriano, who many thought could not be taken down. I think it just shows Nick's upside in general, and in this particular matchup, he's going against a Division One wrestler in Andre Petrosky, someone who does have a grappling background, someone who I do think can test him in certain ways. The problem is Petrosky isn't a very dynamic striker, and Petrosky doesn't have the best cardio, and I really think Petrosky is at his best, at his safest when he's on top of his opponent and he's been sort of bailed out in his last two fights because he's fought michael gilmore and hugh yao zong who are let's call it what it is probably two of the worst fighters in that division in a long time and when he got tired late he was able to take them down lay on them and eventually uh, win by tko ground and pound or submission and i just i don't think that's very likely in this matchup Nick is a very, very, very good wrestler, very skilled submission grappler. Even if Petrosky does land a takedown, I think Nick can scramble free. I also don't really trust Petrosky's defensive grappling. He's quit multiple times on the regional scene, and Maximov has shown pretty good cardio, I mean, in the UFC thus far, coming off, like we said, 11 takedowns. So um, this isn't necessarily the lock of all locks. Maximov's still an up-and-coming prospect. We want to see him put in improvements each and every time out, but... I think this is a good matchup for him. I think he's the better wrestler and grappler. I think we're going to see at some point Petrosky slow down and Maximov get on top and hopefully win this fight inside the distance. Maximov's plus 160 inside the distance currently, which is a decent number. Uh, bottom line is he is relatively safe according to the betting line. He has some finishing upside based on the inside distance number, and he has plenty of wrestling and grappling upside. So I like Maximov at the top of the board at 9.3K in cash games. Moving on to tournaments, going to drop down a little bit here to Eon Kutalaba at 8.9K. Kutalaba facing off against Ryan Spann. Uh, Kutalaba is minus 225 to win, and I think he has early finishing upside in this matchup. Again, nothing's a lock here, but I think Kutalaba is very dangerous, and I really don't trust Spann's um, anything, especially his, his durability. Now, let me pull up his total pro fight record because his submission numbers are, are, are always really interesting to me. This is a guy who is 19 and 7 professionally and he has earned of those 19 pro wins um, let's see 11 have come by submission but 
I think he's like a blue belt in jiu-jitsu, and almost all of these submission wins are by guillotine. And you just feel like that path to victory isn't the most repeatable at the high level of the sport. I mean, he averages 1.58 takedowns per 15 minutes, but he's only won. I mean, he's won by submission. He won on the contender series by guillotine, and he won against Devin Clark by guillotine. So I don't really trust his submission path to victory. His takedown defense isn't very strong at 60%. And his striking, I mean, Span has decent technical boxing, but he's averaging 3.4 significant strikes per minute, absorbing 3.5. He gets hurt often. I mean, he was just badly hurt, knocked down twice, knocked out or, or submitted uh, afterward by Anthony Smith. He hurt Johnny Walker very badly and was still knocked out in that fight. Uh, we saw him knocked out against Carl Roberson. I just don't trust him to take damage. And even over 15 minutes, he just doesn't produce enough offense to consistently win rounds, you know, split decision against Sam Alvey, where he landed 51 strikes, um, unanimous decision against Luis Henrique back in 2018, where he landed 46 strikes. It's just, it's hard to be confident in Span anywhere. I think he might have some boxing advantages over Kudalaba. Kudalaba has cardio advantages. Uh, excuse me. Kudalaba, Kudalaba has cardio concerns. He typically slows down late in fights. Point being, I don't consider Kudalaba the safest fighter on the board. But the dude's a wild man. I mean, he's averaging 4.9 significant strikes per minute, absorbing 3.4. He's averaging 4.3 takedowns per 15 minutes. And, I mean, he's landed eight takedowns and nine takedowns in his last two fights. He has a bunch of early knockout wins with ground and pound. And I just, I trust his durability more at this point. Kudalaba is minus 155 to win inside the distance. That's the best line on this entire slate. If you told me the fight goes to decision, I'm not very confident Kudalaba ends up optimal. I still think he could land takedowns here and there. Um, but there are enough strong options in this top range that I think he would probably miss out on the optimal. But I do think Kudalaba has a pretty good chance to win this fight by knockout early, uh, just based on Span's questionable durability historically. And with a great inside distance layer, inside distance line there, minus 155, good price tag, 8.9K. I'm definitely willing to take some chances on Kudalaba this week. He will be my tournament play of the week. Next up for my salary play of the week, I'm going to give out Frank Camacho at 7.9K facing newcomer Manuel Torres. Uh, the fight is pretty close to evens. Last I looked, uh, Torres minus 125, Camacho plus 105. Torres is making his UFC debut here uh, coming off the Contender Series. But the problem with Torres, he's 12-2 and two professionally. There's just almost no no tape out there on him five wins by knockout six wins by submission i think they almost all come in round one um even his win on the contender series he like poked the guy in the eye a minute like a minute and a half into the fight and the well it might have been a knuckle i'm not totally sure but pretty sure he poked him in the eye and so his opponent you know turned his back and was covering his eye and then torres just finished him uh because herb dean didn't step in to stop the fight so it's just hard to take too much away from that the fight prior he won with a 25 second guillotine choke fight prior he won um by rear naked choke in a minute his losses a minute and 20 second knee bar 59 second heel hook it's, it's really really tough to know what torres brings to the table at this current moment, I think he has early finishing upside against an opponent in Camacho who can be hurt, can be finished. Um, Camacho's certainly not the most consistent fighter in the UFC. He's only won two of his seven UFC fights, and he's been submitted and knocked out in the first round in both of his last two fights in 2019 and 2020. So I, I definitely like Torres in tournaments. Uh, for his early finishing potential. I'm not saying do not play him. However, there, there's just no reason for me to believe that he's going to beat 
Camacho over three rounds if he can't get an early finish. Um, Camacho defends takedowns pretty well at 72%. Camacho's landing 6.6 significant strikes per minute. He gets hit a lot, but like, you know, he lost to Benil Dariush by submission. That's Dariush is a great fighter. He lost to Jeff Neal by knockout. In 2018, Neil was like in his prime then, a great striker. Drew Dober landed 145 significant strikes on Camacho and won by decision. Dober's a, a, a very, very good fighter. He lost to Lee Jing Liang. These are top level fighters. And I just, there's no way for me to assume that if Torres cannot get that two minute stoppage, that he wins the fight at all. Camacho fights at such a high pace. He has judo in his game, 1.17 takedowns landed uh, per 15 minutes. I, I think this fight's pretty likely to end inside the distance one way or the other. It's officially minus 260 ends inside the distance. So this is one of my favorite fights on the slate to target in tournaments. Like I said, Torres has upside at 8.3K. I think he's going to be a, a popular target. But for 7.9K below the mid-range, I like Camacho. Um, he's going to have a dangerous first couple minutes, but I really think... If he can survive, he's going to turn the tide, press on this young kid, throw strikes at a high volume, tire him out, and probably get a finish. So uh, one way or the other, I like this fight. I think both sides have high upside, and I lean toward Camacho being the fighter who's competed many times in the UFC, has gone the distance many times, has fought very good competition, and he will be my salary play of the week. Finally, my fade of the week Wow, this is really tough, and I, I totally butchered it last week with Godinez, and when you when you miss a fighter that badly, all you got to do is give her props, right? She went out there and landed a ton of takedowns, ended up on the optimal lineup, and props to her. I should have given out Norma Dumont. Um, it's just tough because all these fighters have paths to victory. All these fighters that I'm looking at, at least in terms of my fades of the week, they're favored to win. Um, there's path for them to end up on the optimal lineup and it's just, it makes for a tough category, but that's why I like, you know, that's why we're doing this. Right. And so I'm going to give out Caitlin Chukagian this week, mostly by default, because I think Maximoff has finishing upside. I think Davy Grant can win by knockout. You know, Tyra has a lot of early grappling upside. Kudalaba, we already talked about Jake Hadley, probably some of the best wrestling on this slate, uh, Rakic is in the main event. So who, you know, they're, they're just, it's hard to, it's hard to pinpoint a fate of the week. And Caitlin Chukagian at 8.6 K, I actually do think she has upside. Like I said, with Godinez last week, who could wrestle, she went out there and wrestled very, very well, end up in the optimal lineup. Chukagian's fighting Amanda Rebos, who has a questionable chin and has been hurt a couple times in the UFC. And like, Chukagian is not at all known for hurting her opponents, but would I be stunned if she went out there and, and knocked Rebos out? Not really. I, I wouldn't. So if you're playing 150 lineups, you're chasing large field tournaments, I don't actually think you have to fade Chukagian. She's going to be a, a decent contrarian option. The thing is, just you know, how much exposure are we really going to get to her? She doesn't really have any paths to scoring points besides significant strikes um she's won in the ufc let's see three four five six seven eight nine ten times and she scored 83 points or more once once out of ten times and that was against antonina shevchenko in a fight she earned 12 minutes of control and three takedowns so that was her only wrestling base path to victory her only wrestling victory in the UFC um, against Amanda Rebos, who's a very, very good submission grappler, a pretty good wrestler. I, I don't think Chukagian is going to be grappling. Chukagian is going to have to defend takedowns, keep the fight standing where she's a better striker at range. She can land strikes in volume. She loves those tennis sounds where she grunts, yells every time, key eyes every time she throws a punch. Um, and she can land punches in volume, but like just as an example, she beat Viviani Arujo. She landed 127 significant strikes, scored 82 points on DraftKings. At 8.6K, that's not enough. And despite what I said about maybe she can win inside the distance, maybe she can knock uh, Amanda Rebus out, her inside distance line is, is very, very poor. 
she's plus 390 to win inside the distance. So on a slate with, with good options, it's just going to be hard for me to recommend any real exposure to Chukagian. I think she can definitely win a decision. I think she can, you know, maybe she can hurt Reebok. She can land a bunch of strikes. But for her to score 100 plus fantasy points, she's really going to need to finish. Her odds don't indicate there's a great chance of that happening. There are other fighters in this range who I prefer. Therefore, Chukagian will be my fade of the week. All right, guys, that's it for this week's UFC Quick Picks. Thank you again for the support. You can follow me on Twitter at BradAppleyDoubleTWP, DailyFandomMMA.com for all your DraftKings breakdowns needs. Uh, let me know again in the comment section below who you like below 8.7K. Subscribe to the channel, like the video. Really appreciate your support. Best of luck this week. Take care, everyone. Talk to you soon. Peace.